Well, shalom, everyone. Welcome. It's time for us to get started. Glad you could join us here on this new moon of the ninth month. Obviously, it's the first day of the ninth month. And based on our reckoning of the calendar, we are in the 42nd year of the 40th Jubilee. I'd like to uh, start services by asking James if he could please open in prayer, if you'll all stand. And we'll, uh, we'll have the opening prayer by James Daly. James, over to you. Yes, thank you. Our Father, Yehovah, the maker of everything that exists, We ask for your assistance for all your people around the world who are being assaulted by elements of mankind that are not willing to follow your way of life and follow your will. We ask that our accuser's house become divided and start a war against themselves. We ask that all of mankind, to the best of their ability, stop the child living sacrifices that are happening around the world. We ask you please to protect and watch over Donald Trump as he's making his best effort to stop these child sacrifices. We ask for you to protect him as well so that he can uh, do his part, follow the responsibility that he has to you in stopping these child living sacrifices. So we give you thanks everything that we received wherever we are in the, this planet that you've made it is being in fact cannibalized by a, a new world order that almost seems to be wishing to destroy all your work so we ask that we can be good examples to all of mankind. I ask that you please strengthen us. Give us the correct words we use. We may need when we're entering in discussion on you, you and your will and the will of mankind that supposes you. I ask please for all of your people throughout the world. If you please heal them where appropriate strengthen them improve their understanding or really all of our understanding and give us the correct words to use with whoever we, we find ourselves communicating with so we can use your words against those that are hostile uh, give you thanks for life Give you thanks for all the protection and the blessings that we received. We ask that we can be better examples to all of mankind, especially those we are closest to. So we give you thanks to life for life. We ask for all of this, please, in the authority of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, James. Much appreciated. It's, uh, you know, we are, uh, we're instructed to pray without ceasing. And so when we come together and pray like this, I think it sends a powerful message. Obviously, we should be spending our own time uh, with our Father in Heaven in prayer, but uh, when we 
say amen, so be it, um, to a prayer like this. I think uh, it has a powerful effect. So thank you so much for leading us in that prayer. If you'll now remain standing and take up your hymnals, open them up to page 53, we'll sing our first hymn, which is uh, which comes from Psalm 71, and it's titled, O Yah, Forsake Me Not, and that's on page 53. Okay, that's a beautiful hymn and something uh, at least King David prayed a lot about is that uh, he asked that, you know, God would not forsake him and that would he would deliver him from his trials. And I'm sure we all pray the same thing. Okay, if you'll now turn over a couple of pages to page 56, we'll sing our second hymn, which comes from Psalm 74, titled, The Day and Night Are Thine. After which, uh, Jerry, I don't know if you would be willing to read in the book of Judges, uh, read chapters uh, 16 through 18. Um, I'd appreciate that. Okay, so... First, we'll sing page 56, The Day and Night Are Thine, after which we'll turn the mic over to Jerry Shalesky to read in the book of Judges, chapters 16 through 18.
Okay, you'll now be seated. We'll turn the mic over to Jerry Chaleski to read in the book of Judges, chapters 16 through 18. Jerry, over to you. Did you hear me okay? Loud and clear. I'll be reading out of the King James Version, uh, chapter 16 of God's Holy Word of the book of Judges. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in to, unto her and was told the Gazites saying, Samson has come hither and they compassed him and laid wait for him all night in the gates of the city. And we're all quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and rose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with him, far and all, and put them under his shoulders and carried him up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Shurek, whose name was Elijah. Elijah. And the Lord of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, but what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we give thee every one of us eleven hundred pieces of eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy strength, great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If thy bind me with seven green wits, that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. And the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven greens with which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the wits as a thread of tow is broken when it touched the fire, so his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee. Samson, and there were liars in wait abiding in the chambers, and he broke them from off his arms like a thread. And Deliah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pin, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee. Samson, and he awoke out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thou heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast told, not told me within thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words, and they urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Then he told her all his heart, and said unto her, Thou had not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delijah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this head once, for he has shown me all of his heart. Then the Lord of the Philistines came up unto her, and brought money into their hands. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as I have other times before and shake myself. And he was not that the Lord was departed from him. He wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with feathers of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. 
Then the Lord of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God. And rejoice, for they said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. When the people saw them, him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country would slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and made them sport. And they said, him before they set him before the pillars and samson sent unto the lad that held him by the hand suffer me that i may feel the pillars or upon the house stand it that i may be upon them now the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the philistines were there and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while samson made sport and samson called unto jehovah and said O jehovah God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which he was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord's, and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than which he slew in his life. Then his brother and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him in Zorah in Ishola in the burying place of Moham, his father, in his, and he judged Israel 20 years. Chapter 17. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou curthest, and spoke it of also in my ears, behold, the silver is mine. I took it, and his mother said, Blessed be thou of Jehovah, my son. And when he has restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I have wholly dedicated silver unto Jehovah from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took the 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven, Im graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had the house of God's and made it ephod and a terrapin and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest in those days there were no king in israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes and there was a young, a young man out of bethlehem judah of the family of judah who was a levite and he sojourned there and the man departed out of the city from bethlehem judah to so sojourn where he could find a place, and he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence thou comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of the Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals, so the Levite went in. And the Lev Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And as Micah consecrated the Levite, the young man became his priest, and he was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Thou knowest that Jehovah will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. In those days there were no king in Israel, in those days the tribes of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And the children of Dan sent out their family, five men from their coast, men of valor from Zorah and from Estola, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, Go search the land, who when they came to Mount Ephraim, the house of Micah, they lodged there. 
And they were by the house of Micah. They knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. They turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought us thee hither? What makest thou in this place? What hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and it had hired me, and I am his priest. And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace before Jehovah is in your way, wherein you goeth. Then the five men departed and came to Ladash, and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt perilous after the manner of the Zodianians, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And they were far from the Zodians, and had no business with any man. And they came on to their brethren to the Zora, and to Estiel, and their brethren said unto them, What saith ye? And they said unto him, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye yet still, be not slothful to go, and to enter to possess the land. And when you go, you shall come on to a people secure to a large land. For God has given into your hands a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. And they went from thence of the family of the Danites, out of Zorah, and out of Estola, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. And when they went up and pitched in Kajar, Jerim, in Judah, wherefore they call that place Mahani Dan unto this day, behold, it is behind Kajar, Jerim. They passed thence unto Mount Ephraim, and came unto the house of Michal, and answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Lash, and said unto the brethren, Do you know that there is in these houses an Ephraim, and a Terahin, and a graven image, and a molten image? Now therefore consider what you have to do. And they turned thither wards, and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, and came unto the house of Micah, and saluted him. And the six hundred men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither, and the, took the graven images and the ephob and the therapin and the molten images. And the priest stood in, in the entering of the gate with 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched a carving art image, ephob, the therapin, and the molten image, then said the priest unto them, What do ye? And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thy hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. It is better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, for thou wilt be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad, and he took the Ephraim, the therapin, and the graven image, and went into the midst of the people. So they turned and departed and put the little ones in the cattle in the carriage before them. When they were a good ways from the house of Micah, the men that were in the house near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest out with such a company? And he said, You have taken away my gods, which I have made, and the priests and you are gone away. What I have and more, what is this that thou you say unto me? What aileth thee? And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, but angry fellows run up upon thee, and thou wilt lose thy life with the wives of thy household. And the children of Dan went their way. When Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned back, he turned and went back into the, his house. And they took the things which Micah had made, and the priests which he had, and came unto Leish, unto a people that were at quiet and secure. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and burnt the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from Zidon, and they had no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lieth by beth Rahab, And they built a city, and dwelled therein. And they called the name of that city Dan, after the name of Dan their father, was born unto Israel, albeit the name of that city was Leish at the first. 
And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gishon, son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests of the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up, Micah's graven images, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shalom. That's the end of today's reading. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate that impromptu reading of uh, scripture for us. Um, if you'll now please stand and take up your hymnals one more time. We'll sing our third hymn, which can be found on page 62. And it comes from Psalm 81, which uh, is titled, Praise Yehovah with a Psalm. That's uh, page 62, Praise Yehovah with a Psalm. After which I'll be back with the main message, which is titled Apocalyptic Interpretation of the Promise of the Kingdom. And this is a follow on from last week's, uh, last Sabbath's study about the Kingdom of God in the Old Testament. So uh, this is a look at what uh, the, uh, the writers in the New Testament and some of the uh, apocalyptic writers um, thought of uh, the kingdom of God. So uh, I think you'll find it quite interesting. But first we'll sing page 62, Praise Yehovah with a song. Okay, if you'll all be seated, we'll now uh, have our uh, main message, which, as I said, is titled The Apocalyptic Interpretation of the Promise of the Kingdom. And this is a, uh, a chapter out of a book written by George Eldon Ladd. Um, and uh, we covered an aspect of the, the promise of the kingdom from the perspective of the Old Testament. And this week I thought we would cover uh, the perspective from the New Testament. 
And uh, so the centuries uh, following the restoration from Babylon involved the Jewish people in an historical and theological dilemma. And there was a dark meaning that they couldn't easily interpret. The prophets had proclaimed God's judgment in history upon Israel for the apostasy and disobedience and had held out the hope of repentance, conversion and the kingdom of God, right? This was the message in the Old Testament. When the Jews returned to the land, they renounced the, their former uh, sins like idolatry, giving themselves devotedly in obedience uh, to the law of God as never before, separating themselves from sinful alliances with their pagan neighbors. You can see that in Nehemiah 8 uh, through 10. And never had Israel really displayed a more heroic devotion to the law of God than in the days of the Maccabees when many devout Jews uh, gladly suffered torture and martyrdom rather than betray their devotion to God and the law. You can see that in the second book of Maccabees 5 through 7. Now, how accurately they were keeping the law, um, I don't know, but they were certainly dedicated. As we know that... Uh, you know, many Babylonian beliefs and practices crept into what we call Judaism, um, which isn't a true, the true religion of God. But So it was probably some corrupt version of that. However, in spite of Israel's faithfulness, God's kingdom didn't come. It never materialized. Instead came the kingdom of the Seleucids and uh, the determination to turn the Jews away from their fanatical devotion to the law and to force them to adopt Greek habits. So they tried to convert the Jews away from their religion. And this bloody period was followed by a century of Jewish independence. But the increasing worldliness and Greek-loving ways of the Hasmonean rulers uh, proved that obviously this wasn't the kingdom of God they were looking for either. And finally, with the appearance of Pompey in uh, Palestine in 63 BC, the hopes for Jewish sovereignty were crushed under the iron foot of Rome. And during the New Testament period, the sight of Roman standards in Jerusalem was a vivid reminder that every devout Jew, uh, that while the kingdom of God might exist in heaven, the kingdom of Rome ruled on earth. Now, the thing that they failed to realize was the fact that they were still in a state of disobedience. And this quote-unquote law that they were keeping was this, this oral law of the Pharisees uh, that were in charge at the time. The enigma of the rule of wicked pagan nations instead of, God's, uh, of God over uh, his righteous people is expressed in the pathetic cry of the first century A.D. apocalyptist. If the world and, and this comes from 4 Ezra 6.59. It says, uh, If the world has indeed been created for us, why do we not possess our world as an inheritance? Now, the hard fact was that the promises of the prophets appeared to be frustrated. Right? Israel was no longer, at least in their eyes, an apostate backsliding people. She was devoted to her God and obedient to his law. She spurned idolatry and meticulously separated herself from what they considered to be uncleanness. And again, this is a, a corrupt version of what the religion that we call Judaism, or that they call, you know, that is called Judaism. 
the irrational conduct of devout Jews in the practice of their unreasonable religion became an object of ridicule among their pagan neighbors. And still, yet, the kingdom didn't come. And history was shot through with evils for which there was no prophetic explanation. And this perplexing fact demanded a new interpretation of the hope of the kingdom and the apocalyptic writings provided just that reinterpretation. Now, the word apocalyptic is derived from the New Testament Apocalypse 1.1 and is applied by modern scholars to a particular type of Jewish writing produced between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. Now, most discussions of apocalyptic fail to point out that the word is used to describe two different historical phenomena, a genre of literature and the particular kind of eschatology embodied in this literature. A preliminary question is that of the religious melee of this literature. Until recent years, we possess practically no historical information to answer this question and scholars differed radically as to the role of these writings in first century Judaism. Extensive new information about first century Judaism has come to hand in the so-called Qumran literature, but new problems uh, have also been raised. One fact is clear, the Qumran community prized the apocalyptic writings and this is proved by the fact that the fragments of the books themselves or of the sources of several of the uh, apolo uh, apocalypses have been found. So they, you know, they have uncovered a lot of these, these fragments and writings. And, and this includes fragments of 10 manuscripts of Jubilees, fragments of 10 manuscripts of four of the five parts of Enoch, and fragments of sources of the testaments of Levi and of Naphtali. This fact has led some scholars to conclude that the Qumran community, or rather the Proto-Essenes, of which it was one community, uh, per produced and preserved the apocalyptic literature, and that these writings should be interpreted in the, the sits in Leben of the thought of this community. However, H. Rengren admits only the possibility of the Essenic source of the apocalyptic writings, and while they are marked similarities between the eschatological ideas of the Apocalypses and the other Qumran literature, there are also striking differences. And perhaps this problem can be solved if we had sufficient control over these writings to reconstruct the 200-year-old history of the Essene movement. However, the only fragments of the Apocalypses or their sources have been found at Qumran and, and Cross believes that the Apocalypses in their present form as well as other later apocalyptic materials, for example, Second Baruch, the similitudes of Enoch, Second Enoch, Four Ezra, the Assumption of Moses, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, uh, perhaps uh, these have not been found at Qumran. Therefore, we can hardly conclude uncritically that the views found in the present form of the Apocalypses represent the views of the Essenes, right? There's just not enough evidence to tie those two firmly together. And so we'll deal with the Apocalypses as they stand and await further revelation or light uh, to be shed upon um, their, their historical linkage. Now, as a genre of literature, apocalyptic is notable for several features which set it apart from prophetic literature. There is, however, no sharp break between the two types. 
Isaiah 24 through 27 is often called an apocalypse because it shares a distinct catastrophic form of eschatology, but it lacks most of the other characteristics of apocalyptic. Joel and Zechariah 9 through 14 lay a much stronger emphasis on the cataclysmic character of apocalyptic eschatology than does much of the prophetic literature. And the book of Daniel is usually called the first of the apocalypses, but in view of the fact that it shows prophetic traits which are lacking in the other apocalypses, uh, Daniel has to be really contrasted as well as compared with the non-canonical writings, for it stands between uh, the prophetic and the fully developed apocalyptic writings. And there's no evidence to support the validity or, or authenticity of these, these pseudepigraphical writings, right? These non-canonical works. And in fact, some recent studies, um, Nehemiah Gordon, uh, for instance, has proven linguistically that the book of Jasher that exists today and a lot of people refer to is not really the book of Jasher that is referenced in scripture. So you have to be very careful when dealing with these non-canonical writings. Um, you know, if you believe that scripture is inspired, then we have to believe, I think, that the almighty creator God is able to influence mankind enough to put the works together that he wanted us to have. So we have to be very careful. You can look at it maybe from an historical context, but you have to be very careful in reading into those works any kind of accuracy in terms of the Bible. And they, they can be accurate, and some are, and some can have information in them that is helpful. Just my, my cautionary note is just to be careful. So the first characteristic of apocalyptic writing as a literary genre is suggested by the word itself. It is revelatory in a special and technical sense. Now, we may understand the genius of apocalyptic literature by comparing and contrasting its concept of revelation with that of the prophets. For the prophets, the central content of revelation was the will of God and the chief means of revelation was the word of the Lord. The prophets foretold God's action in the future. That in its light, they re might reinforce the present demands of divine will, right? We studied that last time. Their goal was to bring repentance to the people at that time. So they, they foretold these future judgments and punishments to, to reinforce the present demands of the will of God and what he, he desired and required of his people. Furthermore, while the prophets received revelations through dreams and visions, these were not their main um, stock in trade, if you will. Um, the word of the Lord, the dynamic message of the living God, was the center of their experience. So the visions weren't really the focus. It was the word of God and what God required of his people. Dreams and visions were never an end in, in themselves, but were accompanied by an explanatory word. So there was always some interpretation of the vision that had significance. All apparitions are verbal and revelatory. The visual part vanishes, but the words and the understanding remain. And that's true of nearly all visions. Revelation and visions is also uh, verbal re revelation. 
Often the word came without dream or vision, but as a powerful inner voice laying hold of the prophet. Right, so the, 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 the vision or the voice was in their head. The word of God is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, said Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 9. With the apocalyptists, the center of interest has shifted. The living word of God has given way altogether to revelations and visions. God no longer speaks by his spirit to the prophet. The seer learns the solution to the problem of evil and the coming of God's kingdom through dreams, visions, or other heavenly journeys with angelic guides. By means of these media, the apocalyptist discovers the secrets of the hidden world, the reason for the suffering of the righteous on earth, and when and how the kingdom will come. And consonant with this is the consciousness in Judaism that the living voice of God through the prophets was no longer heard. And this is reflected in the history of the Maccabean times and in Josephus, and in the rabbinic literature. The emphasis which the Qumran community placed upon the inspiration of the Holy Spirit can't really be understood as a revival of the prophetic gift. For the Qumran, the Qumran sect did not receive a word direct from God, but believed themselves to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to find the true hidden meaning in the Old Testament scriptures. Thus we read in the commentary on Habakkuk, where it says, And God told Habakkuk to write down the things which will come to pass in the last generation, but the consummation of time he made not known to him. And as for that which he said, that he may read it easily that reads it, the explanation or pesher of this concerns the teacher of righteousness to whom God made known all the mysteries or razim of the words of his servants, the prophets. God had revealed his secrets, this razim, to the prophets, but to the true, the, the true explanation or, or exposition, which is the Hebrew word pesher, of these secrets was reserved by God until the end time when the Holy Spirit would enable the teacher of righteousness, and in their minds, the founder of the Qumran community, by inspiration to penetrate these mysteries and thus to understand and teach the events of the end time. The revelation pictured in the hymns is in terms of its content the same as the knowledge which can be gained through study of the law and the prophets. So this apocalyptic exegesis, if you will, which found the secrets of the end time in an inspired interpretation of the law and the prophets is very different from the revelations of the apocalypses. These Qumran teachers sought a true understanding of the revelation given long ago, whereas the apocalyptists announced new revelations directly from God. See, these, these people didn't recognize the authority of uh, the New Testament church at all. They were concerned to explain the tragic evil of their own times and to offer hope for its final resolution, right? right, And that's how people are, right? They wanna to try to explain why things are happening to them as opposed to admitting to themselves that they're in error and they need to repent. They try to find justification. Enoch, for instance, is shown 
for uh, shown that the fearful evil among men is due to the fallen angels who disclose to men secrets of unrighteousness which led to universal corruption from Enoch 9 6. The solution to the problem of evil won't be found in this age but only at the coming of the Lord with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly from Enoch 1 9. Now, secrets of the heavenly world and secrets of the eschatological denouncement are the two themes about which the apocalyptists declare new revelations received by visions, dreams, or by journeys to the heavens. We should note that some of the books usually called apocalyptic are not true apocalypses in that they are not revelations from the apocalyptic sort. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs contains eschatology of an apocalyptic character, but the literary form of the book as a whole excludes it from the genre of apocalyptic. Each of the Twelve Patriarchs gives a brief resume of his life, makes a moral application, and usually offers a brief prediction of the future of his descendants. In form, the book is imitative prophecy rather than apocalyptic. Its primary concern is ethical rather than eschatological, and it contains a universalism which is alien to the usual spirit of the apocalypses. Right, so it's not your typical apocalyptic writing. And we would agree with Glasson that this book ought not to be included in the apocalyptic genre at all. The Psalms of Solomon uh, are not apocalyptic, i.e. revelatory in nature, but are patterned after the Old Testament Psalms. Since two of the Psalms anticipate the coming of Messiah and the kingdom of God, and you can see that in, in chapters 17 and 18, they are usually included in the survey of Jewish apocalyptic literature, but they're not really apocalyptic uh, as a whole. The Sibylline oracles put into the mouth of a pagan prophetess predictions about the future, including the coming of the kingdom, and therefore, in the broadest sense of the word, they could be included in as, as apocalyptic type. However, eschatology plays a very small role in the oracles, and they should be classed as apologetic rather than apocalyptic literature. Now, these last three books illustrate the fact that apocalyptic literature and apocalyptic eschatology are not identical. They're not the same thing. The apocalyptic type of eschatology found expression in literary forms which were not apocalyptic in character. A second characteristic of apocalyptic literature is the imitative and artificial nature of its revelations. And this stands in contrast to the visions of the canonical prophets, which involve genuine subjective experiences. Theology traditionally has recognized a transcendent factor in the pro prophetic experiences, which sometimes operated through the media of psychological visions, but sometimes transcended them. Now, many scholars will attempt to explain these experiences exclusively in terms of psychological experience and often appeal to the realm of the abnormal, but there remains an element which defies control. And whatever the explanation, prophets offer, they, they, prophets often experienced visions and dreams and then proclaimed the word of God to the people. 
Other prophets displayed little of the ecstatic element, but spoke from deep inner conviction, borne in upon them by the word of God. An entirely different atmosphere pervades apocalyptic literature. You don't see that same level of genuineness. While a few of the apocalyptists may have experienced some sort of subjective experience as a result of brooding over the problem of evil, Porter was correct in saying that the visions described in the apocalypses are beyond doubt in the majority of cases not real visions at all, but literary fictions. They're anecdotal in nature. They're telling a story to try to prove some moral point. And this is not to deny that the apocalyptists, like the prophets, believed that they had a real message from God to deliver to the suffering faithful. There is, however, a great difference. The prophets, out of real experiences, confronted the people with the will of God, reinforcing the challenge with announcements of God's purpose for the future. The apocalyptists, brooding over unfulfilled promises of the prophets and the evils of their own times, used vision as a literary device to assure an imminent deliverance. The prophets were essentially preachers of righteousness to the nation. We don't know that the apocalyptists engaged in any kind of public ministry. They were authors, not preachers. And thus, the apocalyptists, in imitation of the visions of the prophetic literature, transposed subjective vision into literary genre. It was a, as always, right, when Satan seeks to deceive, he creates a copy, an image of things. A third characteristic of this type of literature is pseudonymity. Usually, the apocalyptists employed the transparent fiction of using the name of the Old Testament saint as a means of validating their revelation. And many critics feel that the real authors didn't intend to deceive their readers by this devout fiction. But if the prevailing interpretation of the reason for pseudonymity is valid, the authors expected their pious fraud <laughs> to be taken seriously. They used the name to add validity to what they were saying. And how could such revelations gain any hearing at all. The age of prophecy was over. God no longer spoke through the living voice. Since, therefore, the apocalyptist could not speak as a prophet, thus said the Lord, he borrowed an Old Testament saint and attributed the visions to him, that the writing might receive authority from the prophetic name. Right, so, so it was he couldn't say, "Thus said the Lord," because God wasn't speaking. So he had to borrow the name. In this connection, we must observe that Daniel is not really um, synonymous uh, for Daniel is not an Old Testament saint whose name could be used to give authority to a book. Apart from the stories in the book of Daniel, there is a non-entity. And this fact lends credence to the view that whatever the date of composition of the book of Daniel, it embodies traditions of an historical person who lived in the time of the captivity. A fourth literary characteristic of the Apocalypses is pseudo-prophecy. The Apocalyptus not only borrowed an Old Testament saint as the alleged author of his book, 
He also rewrote the history of Israel from the time of the alleged author to his own time, but cast it in the form of prophecy. Now the prophets were men known to their audiences, and they took their stand in their local his, their, their, their own historical situation and proclaimed their message to their own generation against the background of the coming of the kingdom of God. Each prophetic writing reflects the events of its own time, which the critic must study to determine the date of the book. But historical events were foretold which yet lay in the future. Now the apocalyptists, on the other hand, often took their stand in the distant past and rewrote history down to their own times as though it were prophecy. And so it's prophetic after the fact. Attributing the pseudo-prophecy to the pseudo-author. Right? So it's it a complete fiction. And it's frequently possible to follow the course of the alleged prophecy down to the actual author's own time when the predictions of historical events become vague and the kingdom is expected to come. And this is something what, what uh, Nehemiah Gordon found, right, was that the language used in the book of Jasher was not the same language being used at the time that it was supposedly written. So that's how you can tell that it wasn't written at the time it said it was written. So there are clues to these types of things. Now the obvious advantage of that technique was that it allowed the author to reinterpret history in terms of his particular interest, to explain the reasons for the prevalence of evil and the sufferings of the righteous and to assure the faithful that deliverance was at hand and the kingdom about to come. And then a final characteristic of the apocalyptic genre is the use of symbolism in declaring the will of God for his people. And this goes back to the prophets. To, illus to, to illustrate Israel's corruption, Jeremiah buried a linen cloth until it was spoiled in Jeremiah 13, 1 through 11. His vision of two baskets of figs illustrated God's future purpose for his people from Jeremiah 24. Ezekiel's vision of the resurrection of a valley full of bones pictured the future return of Israel to national life in Ezekiel 37. Hosea's tragic marital experience was a divinely commanded symbol of God's relationship to his adulterous people from Hosea 1. With Zechariah, symbolic visions reach a new dimension. The first six chapters contain eight visions, each involving developed symbolism. The last vision is of four chariots with red, black, white, and dappled gray horses, which came from between two mountains of bronze to patrol the four corners of the earth. From Zechariah 6, 1 through 8. Now these chariots are symbolic of the accomplishment of God's will in all the earth. They are not designed to be identified with specific historical events or personages. Furthermore, the visions of these six chapters are concerned more with contemporary events than with the future. And the eschatological chapters of Zechariah 9 through 14 have have less of symbolism than the earlier chapters. So there's not as much symbolism in the later chapters as there is in the beginning chapters, the early chapters. In the use of symbolism, Daniel goes beyond the other prophets. There's a lot of symbolism in the book of Daniel. And he employs symbolism to represent events in history. The great image of gold, silver, brass, and iron represents four successive nations in history before the coming of God's kingdom in Daniel 2, as do the four beasts in Daniel 7. So this literary device is greatly elaborated in the subsequent apocalypses. 
In Enoch's dream vision from Enoch 85 to 90, the course of history is retold in symbolism of a veritable menagerie. Ezra's vision of an eagle with 12 wings, three heads, and eight opposing wings represents historical events connected with Rome from 4 Ezra 11. And such symbolism is not always employed. Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks uh, from Enoch 91, 12 through 17, and 93, 1 through 10, and the Assumption of Moses trace the course of history without the use of apocalyptic symbolism. So we must now consider the characteristics of apocalyptic eschatology. The worldview expressed in the apocalyptic literature is a distinct philosophy of history. It provided an explanation for the apparent frustration of the prophetic promises. Right? Why hadn't these promises come to pass? And they provided an explanation, as it were, for the delay of God's kingdom and the domination of history by evil in spite of the faithful observance of the law by the righteous. Of course, they were failing to realize that they were not observing the law. They were observing the commandments of men. So, you know, these people, these people uh, were misled, deceived, perhaps. So there's this, this, the first characteristic of apocalyptic eschatology is its dualism. The term can be a little bit confusing because it's used in the study of ancient religions to designate several different kinds of thought. For the sake of clarity, these have to be summarized. Uh, there is a simple ethical dualism found in the Old Testament which contrasts righteousness with unrighteousness, life with death, from Deuteronomy 30:19. There's a physical, metaphysical dualism that takes two forms. In biblical thought, the creator stands over against his creation, but the creation remains God's world and therefore is never viewed as evil per se. In Platonic thought, this metaphysical dualism takes a more absolute form contrasting the noumenal world with the phenomenal world. And in later Gnostic thought, the phenomenal world is the sphere of darkness, evil, and sin. There is a cosmological dualism also, which sees two ultimate principles of good and evil, or light and darkness, in the universe struggling with each other. In Zoroastrianism, uh, this cosmic dualism embodies the principles of good and evil, light and darkness, in the evil spirit Ariman and the good spirit Ahura Mazda, or, or Mazd. And while these are coeval in origin, they are not coeternal, for ultimately light will overcome and destroy darkness. Now, these are very deep subjects that require more study, but hopefully you understand the gist, right? There are, there are two sides, this dualism, evil and, and good. And, and eschatological dualism contrasts a present time of evil, suffering, and death with a future time of righteousness and life. Developed Zoroastrian doctrine taught that Saushient, a hero born of the seed of Zoroaster, 
and therefore not a god, would raise all the dead, bringing them into a blessed immortality, which was described in terms of the perfection of earthly life. The consummation was thus a final rehabilitation of the entire race. And meanwhile, Ormazd would bring about the final defeat of Ahriman, and thus the Zoroastrianism, cosmological dualism, issued in an eschatological dualism. So one fed into another. The study of dualism in Jewish thought has received new impetus from the discovery of the Qumran literature. H.W. Huppenbauer's book, Der Mensch Zweischen Zwei Welten, and I apologize for slaughtering that, but this book is entirely devoted to the question of dualism in this literature. And two outstanding types of dualism appear in the Jewish literature. The physical metaphysical dualism uh, of the Greek type needs little discussion for apocalyptic dualism usually remains in the Jewish tradition of creation and never becomes a Greek dualism in which creation is the sphere of evil. The dualism of Jewish literature, both Apocalypses and the Qumran writings, combines a cosmological dualism which sees the world in the grip of two conflicting spirits, God and Satan, who is also called Belial, Belier, and Mastema, with an eschatological dualism which limits the struggle between these two powers to this age and sees the complete triumph of God in the age to come. Right? And it, it paints a picture like, you know, God is in a war with Satan, as if Satan has any power to try to, to overcome God in any way. It's, it's quite interesting. And many scholars assume that this development of dualistic thought uh, in Judaism is the result of Zoroastrian and or Gnostic influences. And indeed, we have already noted that some scholars feel that these alien influences introduced a type of eschatology into Jewish thought, which uh, was essentially different from the genuine Hebrew hope. So th this train of thought was very different than the hope that was built by the prophets, the hope in the kingdom, sort of taking on a new flavor. However, this is an assumption which can't be taken for granted. The Zoroastrian eschatology outlined above is found in the uh, Bunda Hisyan which is later than Muhammad and may or may not embody pre-Christian ideas. In any case, as George Foote Moore has pointed out, such alleged influences, if they occurred, only served to sharpen concepts already intrinsic in Jewish thought. Therefore, our problem is to try to determine the relationship between the dualism in the Jewish literature, particularly in the Apocalypses, and in the prophetic writings. What, what relationship is there between those two thought processes? The prophets were conscious of the contrast between God's world and the world of nature and history. While nature and history were under the divine sovereignty, both lay under the curse of sin and the burden of evil. God's kingdom would be established only by an inbreaking of God. God had to intervene in history, and that would result in both a moral and a physical transformation of the present order. We discussed that last time. The problem of undeserved, unexplained evil in historical experience led the apocalyptus to extend and sharpen this contrast between man's world and God's world, and between the present sinful order and the future redeemed order of God's kingdom. 
They developed the concept of evil spirits and Satan already found in the Old Testament to the point of a sharp dualism which never became absolute. Neither the Apocalypses nor the Qumran literature abandon essential monotheism. God has both created Belial and will finally destroy him. However, the apocalyptists often felt that the only explanation for the radical evil in the world is the rule of evil spirits. The Testament of Dan describes the present as the kingdom of the enemy from 6.4. The manual of discipline speaks of this age at the time of the dominion of Belial, as does the war scroll. This overthrow of evil and the establishment of God's kingdom can be accomplished only by a cataclysmic inbreaking of God. The most vivid picture of this apocalyptic visitation is found in the similitudes of Enoch, in which the end is brought about by the glorious coming of a heavenly son of man when the present order is transformed into the glorious order of the kingdom of God. And there is, however, no necessary relationship between an elaborate angelology and this more transcendental form of the kingdom. And this is proved by the fact that in the first part of Enoch, where great emphasis is placed upon the mischief caused by the fallen angels, the kingdom is pictured as an earthly order. Whereas in the similitudes and in for Ezra, where there is the most pronounced eschatological dualism, the fallen angels play a very small role. So this dualistic eschatology gradually developed the terminology of this age and the age to come. And this terminology is implicit in Enoch, but it emerges explicitly only in for Ezra, Baruch, and uh, Perke Eboth, and the New Testament. However, as Bowles points out, the concept is surely older than the terminology, and we may think of the dualistic concept of the two ages before the explicit terminology even emerges. Now, indeed, this idea goes back to the Old Testament. The coming of the kingdom of God will mean a transformation of the present order, which is often so radical that the, the result is a completely new order. And it's impossible to trace a gradual evolution from a simple earthly concept of the kingdom to a radically different transcendental concept. Nor is there a single eschatology, nor a single line of development but rather several different eschatologies. Jubilees and Enoch, 1 through 36, picture an earthly kingdom with no Messiah. The kingdom in Enoch, 1 through 36, is pictured in materialistic terms. The righteous will live and beget thousands of children. The earth will become fruitful and yield wine in abundance and grain a thousandfold. And uncleanness will be purged from the earth and all nations will worship God. You see that in chapter 10, verses 16 through 22. The Psalms of Solomon, 17 through 18, pictures a Davidic Messiah arising from among men. But he is supernaturally endowed to destroy his enemies and to inaugurate an earthly kingdom with Jerusalem as his capital. The similitudes of Enoch, 37 through 71, has a different messianic personage, a pre-existent supernatural son of man who has been kept in heaven since creation, who will sit on the throne of his glory. You can see that in Enoch 47, 3, 51, 3, and 62, 5. And he comes to judge the living and the resurrected dead from 51, 1 through 5. And while the resurrection is described in transcendental language in 62.16, the redeemed will dwell upon a transformed earth. 
It says, I will transform the earth and make it a blessing, and I will cause mine elect ones to dwell upon it. From 45.5. And in those days shall the mountains leap like rams, and the earth shall rejoice, and the righteous shall dwell upon it, and the elect shall walk thereon. From 51.4-5. through 5. This is not transcendental dualism, but a radically developed prophetism along the lines of Isaiah 65.17 and 66.22. A transcendental eschatology is found in the fifth book of Enoch, from 90, chapters 92 through 105, and the final redemption will witness a new heaven, but not a new earth, from 91.16. The righteous are raised from Sheol, 92, 3 through 5, but not in a bodily resurrection. The portals of heaven will open to them, from 104, verse 2. And they will become companions of the host of heaven, from 104, verse 6. The spirits of you who have died in righteousness shall live and rejoice, and their spirits shall not perish, from 103, verse 4. So this brief survey suggests that different apocalyptists dwelt upon various Old Testament pictures of the future, some emphasizing one aspect and others a different aspect. Some prophets had described the future in familiar earthly terms, while Isaiah 65 and 66 looked for a new order so different that it was called a new heaven and a new earth. And some apocalyptists emphasize the earthly aspect of the Old Testament hope, sometimes in very sensuous terms. And others, pondering the implications of a new heaven and new earth, tried to picture what, is, what this transformed order would be like. Two first century AD apocalypses combined the ideas of an earthly kingdom followed by a new creation. That's 4 Ezra 7 and the apocalypse of Baruch 29 through 30. Charles has well said that these conceptions are in germ and principle as old as Isaiah 65 and 66. The problem of es eschatological dualism and the character of the age to come is placed in sharp focus by the eschatology of the Qumran literature. While the terminology of the two ages doesn't occur, the Qumran community was sure that it was living in the end times and that the kingdom of God would shortly be established. And we've been thinking that for <laughs> millennia, apparently. While the, the uh, Hippolytus tells us that the Essenes believed that the world would be destroyed by fire at the end of time. And this teaching is found in the Qumran writings. Now, logically, one might think that the only form of a kingdom which could follow such a conflagration would be a transcendental heavenly order. But logic doesn't determine apocalyptic thought. Out of the universal conflagration will emerge a renewed earthly order. A commentary on Psalm 37 says they will possess the sublime mountain of Israel and will taste everlasting delights in his holiness. The hymns, 1312, speak of the new creation after the existing things have been destroyed. Fragments found in caves 1, 4, and 5 appear to have contained a detailed description of a restored temple to be built on earth, which would be miraculously renewed. And the author concludes that with the possible exception of Enoch 91 through 105, a truly transcendental dualism is not found in the Jewish literature. The kingdom in the age to come is a new and transformed order, but it is a renewed earth, and the life of the age to come means earthly existence freed from all corruption and evil. The pictures of this redeemed order cannot be accounted for in terms of reflection upon the implication of Isaiah's promise of a new heavens and new earth. 
Now, a second characteristic of apocalyptic eschatology is its non-prophetic view of history. The primary concern of the prophets was with God's dealing with Israel in their present historical situation. They constantly referred to Israel's history in order to illustrate God's gracious ways and Israel's faithfulness, or faithlessness, I should say, and announced God's judgments in the immediate future. They also saw in the background the eschatological day of the Lord when the divine purpose would be fulfilled, right? The culmination of the plan of God. However, both the past and the future are usually cited because their relevance, uh, of their relevance for the present. The prophetic message is addressed to Israel in a specific historical situation and the present and the future are held together in an eschatological tension. The apocalyptist lost this tension between history and eschatology. The present and the future are quite unrelated. The apocalyptist couldn't understand the prophetic interpretation of present historical experience as God's judgment upon his people for their apostasy for Israel was no longer faithless in their mind. Has another nation known thee besides Israel? Or what tribes have so believed thy covenants as these tribes of Jacob? Yet their reward has not appeared and their labor has borne no fruit. For I have traveled widely among the nations and have seen that they abound in wealth, though they are unmindful of your commandments. Now, therefore, weigh in a balance our iniquities and those of the inhabitants of the world. And so it will be found which way the turn of the scale will incline. When have the inhabitants of the earth not sinned in thy sight? Or what nation has kept thy commandments so well? Thou mayest indeed find individual men who have kept thy commandments, but nations thou wilt not find. And that's from 4 Ezra 3, 32-36. And you can almost see a self-righteousness in this writing, right? And they're almost accusing God of being unfair to Israel instead of recognizing the fact that they are still apostate. And these commandments of men that they teach are not the commandments of God. A lot of people are going to get a big surprise when that kingdom does come. Of that you can be sure. Now, the words we just read vividly picture the apocalyptic problem. Israel has received and kept God's law. Why then are God's people suffering under the heel of godless pagans? This can't be God's doing. The only answer given is that God's ways are inscrutable. There is no other answer. And how can one who is already worn out by the corrupt world understand incorruption? From 4 Ezra 4.11. Ezra's response is one of utter despair. He says it would be better for us not to be here than to come here and live in ungodliness and to suffer and to underst and not understand why. From Ezra 4.12 And the only solution offered is that God will yet act to rectify the evil of the present. And this age will finally come to its end and God will inaugurate the new age of righteousness. However, this final redemptive act of God has no bearing upon the present. God is no longer redemptively active in the present. Right? God is the God who will come. From 4 Ezra 5:56, 6:18 and 9:2. He is no longer God who comes to the his people in history. He's removed himself from the affairs of mankind. The apocalyptists do not view the coming of the kingdom as the final act of God who is constantly acting in history. 
On the contrary, their writings offer a theological solution in explanation of the failure of God to bring deliverance to his afflicted people. These books are, therefore, not truly historical documents, but theological treatises attempting to solve the enigma of history, which can no longer be interpreted in prophetic terms. In its view of history, Daniel is close to the prophets. The first part of the book stands entirely apart from later apocalypses in that it relates allegedly historical events and God's care for his servants in history. Daniel directly addresses the king to teach him that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men, from Daniel 4.17. Also 521. It was God who had invested Nebuchadnezzar with his regal power from 237, and it was God who humbled the king until he learned the lesson that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. From 432. The God of Daniel is both the God of history and the God of the consummation. Now, an important element in this loss of the prophetic concept of history is a third characteristic, which we may call pessimism. Some scholars object to the use of this term. And we agree with these authors that it's erroneous to call the apocalyptists pessimists in their ultimate outlook, for they never lost their confidence that God would finally triumph they possessed an ultimate optimism which was born of an unshakable faith. Indeed, the very purpose of their writings was to assure God's people that God had not really forsaken them. This, however, is not what we mean by pessimism. The apocalyptists reflect pessimism about this age. The blessings of the kingdom cannot be experienced in the present, for this age is abandoned to evil and suffering. Such a theology was forced upon devout Jews as the only possible explanation for their evil plight. Israel was obedient to the law and yet did not find deliverance. This is in their own mind. The solution to the problem of evil was thrown altogether into the future. The present is irre irremediably evil and the righteous can only submit patiently to suffering sustained by the assurance that deliverance will surely come when the evil age is over and the new age of the kingdom arrives this apocalyptic pessimism must be illustrated in Enoch 6 the evil character of the age is attributed to fallen angels the earth is overrun by evil and corrupted by the fallen angels. God has not, however, ultimately relinquished his sovereignty. Jewish theology could never tolerate such a thought. God continues to rule nature. He has the power over all things. He is the king of the ages, king over all kings, God of the whole world. Yet he has become essentially a deistic God. While God sees and permits evil, he allows it to exercise its influence on earth without restraint. Now after recounting the fearful evil the fallen angels have wrought, contrary to the purpose of God, Enoch complains. He says, And thou knowest all things before they come to pass. And thou seest these things, and thou doest suffer them, or dost suffer them, and thou dost not say to us, what are we to do to them in regard to these? Evil has got out of hand, but God has no word for his people in their fearful plight except the promise of final deliverance. That's their, their thought process. Again, the hopelessly evil character of the age is illustrated by a passage in the similitudes of Enoch. 
When wisdom descended from her dwelling place in heaven to dwell with men, she found no place, but had to return to heaven and take her seat among the angels to await the messianic times. However, according to Enoch, he says, unrighteousness went forth from her chambers, whom she sought not, she found and dwelt with them. And again, in the dream visions of Enoch, God personally guided the experiences of Israel throughout its history until the Babylonian captivity. Then God withdrew his personal leadership, forsook the temple, and surrendered his people to wild beasts to be torn and devoured. God remained unmoved, though he saw it and rejoiced that they were devoured and swallowed and robbed, and left them to be devoured in the land of all the beasts. From Enoch 89.58 Then God turned the fortunes of the nation over to 70 shepherds, instructing them as to the number of Jews who might be slain. However, these shepherds were self-willed and faithless, ignoring the divine directive and permitting fearful evils to befall God's people. When reports of the evil conduct of the shepherds were brought to God, he laid them aside and remained unmoved and aloof. A record was made of the angels' faithlessness that they might be punished on the day of judgment when Israel would be delivered. Between the years 586 and 165 BC, God was conceived to be inactive in the fortunes of Israel. God's people found themselves at the mercy of faithless angels. No deliverance could be expected before the Messianic era. And finally, this pessimism is vividly portrayed in 4 Ezra. This book retains a formal doctrine of God's activity in history. Israel's sufferings have come not from evil angels, but from God's hand. And that's 4 Ezra 3.27 and 30 and 5.28. And it, it comes from God's hand because of her sins. Chapter 3, verse 25. And theologically, Ezra must admit that Israel is a sinful people, yet precisely at this point lies his problem. Israel alone has received God's law and kept it, 655-59, while the Gentiles have rejected it, chapter 3, verses 31-34, through 34, chapter 7, verses 20-24. through 24. Therefore, because God has spared the ungodly and preserved his enemies, but has destroyed his people, from chapter 3, verse 30, Ezra is faced with an insoluble problem with issues in abject, uh, which issues in abject despair. He wishes he had never been born, from 4.12. For the righteous who suffer undeservingly are worse off than the dumb beasts who cannot think about their fate, chapter 7, verse 66. The only hope lies in the future. By divine, divine decree, there are two ages. The present age is hopelessly evil, but the future age will witness the solution to the problem of evil. The righteous, therefore, must now patiently resign themselves to evil in the confidence of a solution in the age to come and are not to be disturbed because the masses perish. God himself is not moved by the death of the wicked. And that's found also in 4 Ezra chapter 7, verse 60, 61, um, chapter 131, or verse 131, and then chapter 8, verse 38 and 55. This age is evil, and hope belongs altogether in the age to come. Now, Daniel stands apart from the later apocalypses in that this pessimistic note is strikingly absent. If the focus of the last half of the book is the coming of God's kingdom, 
It's not because the author despairs of God's acts in history. On the contrary, God's deliverances in history are apparent. He delivered his servants from the fiery furnace, demonstrating to Nebuchadnezzar that he was God. He delivered Daniel from the lions, convincing Darius of the glory of his dominion. It was God who set Nebuchadnezzar on his throne from Daniel 2.37 and removed Belshazzar from Daniel 5.24-28. The God of Daniel, whose sovereignty will in the latter days shatter all other sovereignties from 244, manifest his sovereignty in historical acts. God is both Lord of the end and of the present history. Indeed, God's name is to be blessed forever because he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings from Daniel 2.21. The succession of kingdoms is overruled and ordered by the Most High who rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Daniel 4.25 A central theme of the book is that God is the living God whose kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth from Daniel 6.26, and God never abandons the stage of history. He remains Lord of all. Indeed, it is because he remains the Lord of history that he will finally establish his kingdom on the earth. Right. So rather than this ap apocalyptic view that God has abandoned uh, man to just do whatever he wishes, Daniel's view is that God is still completely in control of what's happening on this earth. A fourth characteristic is determinism. The course of this age is predetermined and must run its course to completion. The kingdom doesn't come even though the righteous deserve it because certain fixed periods must first unfold. Therefore, the kingdom must await the appointed time. Little emphasis is placed upon a sovereign God who is acting through these appointed times to carry out his purposes. Rather, God himself is awaiting the passing of the times which he has decreed. For he has weighed the age in the balance and measured the times by measure and numbered the times by number and he will not move nor arouse them until the measure is fulfilled. The entire course of human history is pre-recorded in heavenly books from Enoch 81, 1 through 3, 103, 1 through 2. And since the time of the end is fixed, the present age is often thought of as divided into certain determined periods. The dream visions of Enoch divide time from the captivity to the end into 70 periods during which Israel is given to the care of 70 shepherds from Enoch 89, 72, 90, verse 1 and 5. Only when the 70 periods have passed can the end come. The apocalypses usually assume that the fixed periods have nearly run out and therefore the end is about to come. Now the final characteristic could be called ethical passivity. The apocalyptists are not motivated by strong moral or evangelical urgency. The prophets continually appealed to Israel to repent and turn from their sins to God. Judgment is to fall upon a sinful nation, but the kingdom will one day come for a righteous remnant. The problem of the apocalyptists was created by their conviction that Israel was the righteous remnant, but they didn't inherit the kingdom. The apocalyptic and rabbinic definitions of righteousness are basically the same, obedience to the law. And this is clearly illustrated in 4 Ezra and Apocalypse of Baruch. And the real irony here is that that's true. 
we do have to obey the law of God. But they're not obeying the law of God. And then they're perplexed as to why they haven't received the kingdom even though they're obedient to the law of God. And they don't understand the timeline and plan of God, obviously. Therefore, the apocalyptus devoted very little space to ethical exhortation. The two notable exceptions are the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs and the last part of Enoch, chapters 92 through 105. The Testaments have a strong ethical emphasis with a noteworthy stress on inward righteousness and the ethic of love. But this sets the book apart from the usual atmosphere of apocalyptic literature. The book is not, in fact, apocalyptic in form. The last section of Enoch defines righteousness in terms of obedience to the law, and as little apocalyptic in the strict sense of the word. The scholars who insist upon a strong ethical emphasis in ap apocalyptic literature draw most of their illustrations from the two canonical apocalypses and from the testaments of the twelve patriarchs. But this is precisely the difference in ethical concern is one of the factors which distinguishes Daniel and Revelation from other apocalypses. Ethical exhortation is lacking because there is a loss of a sense of sinfulness. <laughs> They're self-righteous. The problem of the apocalyptus is found in the fact that the true Israel does keep the law and therefore is righteous and yet is still permitted to suffer. And for Ezra seems to be an exception to this statement, for the author at several points expresses a profound sense of sinfulness. You can see that in chapter 4, verse 12, and chapter 7, verse 118. But this is counterbalanced by a sense of the righteousness of God's people who have received the law and have kept it, and therefore have a treasury of works before God. From chapter 6, verse 5, 7, verse 77, and chapter 8, verse 33. So Ezra's problem is a theological one. The biblical interpretation of the destruction of Jerusalem should lead to a recognition of the sinfulness of God's people, for only great sin could merit such a fearful judgment. Right? Reflecting on this principle, Ezra is thrown into confusion. Israel must be guilty of great sin. The prophetic interpretation of recent history demands this conclusion. And this is Ezra's inherited theology. And yet, as a matter of fact, Israel is not sinful. She has kept the law. This problem created a tension in the author's mind which led to deep despair from chapter 7, verse 118. And a pitiful cry to God to deal with his people in terms of grace. Chapter 8, verse 6. Thus, Ezra's conviction of sin is more a theoretical theology than a deep conviction. And throughout the book, we meet the contrast between the righteous few who have kept the law, which they constitute as Israel, and the mass of men who perish, but about whose fate God is unconcerned. And I don't really think God is unconcerned with any of us. He loves all of his children. Here's another point where Daniel stands closer to the prophets than to the later apocalyptus. He does not claim deliverance for Israel because they are God's covenant people and therefore merit the divine blessing. God's covenant is conditional and God's blessings can be enjoyed only by those who love him and keep his commandments from Daniel 9 4. Daniel has an acute consciousness of sin and his prayer breathes the ethical earnestness of the prophets. Israel is not righteous. She has forsaken the law and ignored the prophets from Daniel 9 5 and is deservedly suffering because of her sinfulness. Daniel can only plead the mercy of God to the ground of forgiveness from 9.17. And this ethical emphasis extends even to the heathen. 
Daniel exhorts the king to break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may be perhaps, or that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your tranquility from Daniel 4.27. Here is the prophetic note. If the king will turn to the Lord, he will experience the divine blessing. God has a due regard for the free decisions of men and renders to them their fate in conformity to their conduct. And this is the note missing in Jewish apocalyptic. So let's summarize what we've covered. The apocalyptic eschatology can be understood as a, an historical development of the prophetic eschatology as the latter is interpreted against the background of the historical evils of the post-Maccabean times. Both prophetic and apocalyptic eschatology can conceive of the establishment of the kingdom only by an inbreaking of God. God has to intervene. And both are essentially catastrophic. In both, the kingdom will be a new and transformed order, redeemed from all corruption and evil. The apocalyptic dualism results from a sharpening of concepts found in the prophets. However, Apocalyptic eschatology has lost the dynamic concept of God who is redemptively active in history. The apocalyptists, contrary to the prophets, despaired of history, feeling that it was completely dominated by evil. Hope was reposed only in the future. The harsh experiences of the last two centuries BC left the apocalyptists pessimistic of any divine visitation in history. God would visit his people to deliver them from evil only at the end of history. Thus the prophetic tension between eschatology and history was lost. God is alone and God uh, is alone the God of the future. He is God of the present only in a theoretical sense. Redemptive history becomes altogether eschatology and eschatology has become a guarantee of ultimate salvation not an ethical message to bring God's people face to face with the will of God. Right? So this, this whole thing, right? They changed the message from drawing people to God and convincing people, crying aloud and sparing not, for people to repent and return to God. And they just focus on the future because they view that God doesn't act in this world today. So salvation is a thing of the future and you don't need to be concerned about it today. So it's a bit of a twisted view. And uh, you can see how these ideas have crept in. You know, some of these thought processes I, I remember from my travels in the churches of God. And so, you know, they have crept in. Uh, there is a whole messianic movement that maintains a lot of Jewish thought. And we have to be very careful. You know, these people, there is a sense of self-righteousness. We're, we're not sinful. Why are we being punished? But we know that they're misled. And... We pray for everybody's eyes to be open and everybody be called to God through our high priest, Yahushua the Messiah. But that is God's call. We cry aloud and we spare not. We tell people their sins and God brings them to repentance as he sees fit. So brethren, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a bit... Um, I don't know what I would call it, wordy or, or uh, perhaps not targeted um, using normal language. Uh, so hopefully uh, it wasn't too uh, confusing, but it's, it's, it's an interesting subject to me anyway, because it kind of shows how these thought processes developed over time.
And sometimes, in order to understand where you are, you have to understand how you got there and some of these ideas. So anyway, hopefully you found it uh, worthwhile. Um, so with that, we will close our formal service. If you all take up your hymnals and open them up to page 74. On page 74, we'll sing our final hymn, which comes from Psalm 98, titled Sing Praises and Rejoice. After which, I'd like to call Jerry back to the mic to uh, close in prayer. So page 74, sing praises and rejoice as our final hymn. Okay, if you'll remain standing for the closing prayer, we'll now turn the mic back over to Jerry Shaleski. Jerry, over to you. Jerry, are you there? No sound. Can anybody hear Jerry or is it just me that can't hear? Okay, well it appears... Alright, we'll give him a minute. Uh, yeah, now we can hear you. Or I did. Okay. <laughs> now, now I hear you. <laughs> Our Father, Most High God, Jehovah of Hosts, we come before you this first day of a new month in the plan of your creation, 
give you the greatest thanks and appreciation for the understanding to love you is to obey your laws and your commandments and your holy word. Father, please hear our prayers and our psalms we sing to you. We would pray you would remove the evil from this world and guide us with your spirit for as long as we have life. Teach us thy ways. And put your laws and your commandments in our hearts and in our minds. Give us the strength and courage, Father, to do what is right in your eyes and to do your will and be a light unto others that we would all glorify you, bless you, and magnify you, the only true God. We wait patiently, Father, for you in the return of your beloved son, Yahushua, our elder brother and high priest, is whose name we pray to you. We ask for your dismissal, a blessing on our new moon meals, and again, we give you the greatest thanks and appreciation for all you have done for us. Amen.